Good morning and welcome comrades and friends to this meeting. We're gonna leave it for a couple of minutes to let more people into the meeting as they're arriving. And then I shall begin. Just to introduce myself, my name is Ruth Stiles. I am the National Chair of the Communist Party of Britain and Chair of the Anti-Racist, Anti-Fascist Commission of the Communist Party. For those of you who are just joining us, um, we're waiting a couple of minutes to allow other people to join in. Uh, and then the meeting, this webinar will begin. Or well, perhaps I should uh, begin and um, lay out some of the uh, arrangements for this webinar. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Ruth Stiles. I'm the Communist Party National Chair. Uh, I'm also Chair of the Anti-Racist, Anti-Fascist Commission of the Communist Party. Um, this is a webinar. And what will happen here today is our speakers will speak for a maximum of 15 minutes each. And if you have questions, they can be placed in the Q&A and we'll then um, take those questions and ask the panelists to respond to it. The objective is to finish by the latest of 12.30. So I hope you um, we will play some questions and we can have a bit of debate about some of the issues facing us today. So welcome to this webinar on imperialism and race. As I said, it's organised by the Communist Party. Um, we hope this will be a fitting contribution to the Black History Month being um, in October of 2022. Uh, I'll repeat again, please put any questions in the Q&A. And we have two speakers today, uh, both of whom ha will have an interesting contribution to make um, in our discussion. Our first speaker will be Nisa Ahmed, who is a member of the Executive Committee of the Communist Party and is an East London community activist. Our second speaker will be Vijay Pradesh, who's the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, chief correspondent for the Globetrotter and editor of the, of, at, sorry, at Leftward, Leftward Books. Um, I hope you enjoy our proceedings today. And on that basis, I'm going to invite Nisa to kick us off. Nisa. <coughs> thank you, Ruth, and thank you, <coughs> audience that has turned up on a Saturday morning to hear us on imperialism and racism. Now, this is a very vast topic to do justice within uh, an hour or even a day. What I will do is briefly look at uh, the history of imperialism without being very academic in terms of debates and things like that, and, and simply look at some of the key, key political economic aspects of it as it has evolved uh, to, uh, to today's imperialism. And I'll also touch on racism and the so-called race policy 
that had been adopted by various governments in UK, and my emphasis will be in UK, after the Second World War and their lessons. And finally, I will try to give concrete examples because we have to politically construct a majority for our progressive politics, and to do that, we need to look at concrete examples where we face these problems of racism and imperialism, and I'll touch on some of them uh, at the end of the lecture. And um, hopefully, I will be speaking from a more broadly Marxist perspective, and I will be speaking from a Marxist perspective uh, on these issues. And, and differences might crop up regarding those. Firstly, uh, stating the obvious for capitalist accumulation to continue unhindered, the exploitation, that is, the capturing of surplus power and extraction of profit, is crucial at all times. Capitalism cannot exist, the accumulation in capitalism cannot exist without that central fact. This is this was true of the colonial period, and this was true of the post-colonial period, and especially during the period 45 to 79, 79 to 2007, and from 2007 to onwards now. This accumulation happened through direct coercion, through indirect means, through quote unquote unequal exchange and in present times what are called value added chains, which is the outsourcing of uh, capital accumulation from the heartlands to the periphery and also uh, how does outsourcing linked with technology play a crucial role in today's imperialism. The, it might seem that capitalism and the accumulation is simply uh, economic, but there is also a political and a military side to it, and that which has been also been key to the development of present day capitalism. We only have to look at what's happening in Ukraine, we only have to look at what's happening in other parts of the world to see that. And also, something that has cropped up, which is the crisis of capitalism in the heartlands, which, have been, which has been there from 2007 onwards in a, in a big way. The political resolution to that has not yet come, uh, either from the left or the right. There are incremental uh, developments happening from the left and from the right, which we all know of. But a settlement, put unquote a settlement, a political settlement hasn't happened. And there is a danger of, uh, ra uh, the danger of fascism creeping up, whether we call it authoritarianism or populism or some form of nationalism. And that is where racism comes in, 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 in a big way, because that is where the right wing, uh, whether through Brexit or through what is happening in Italy, is directing their fire against migrants and other, other people of color. Before decolonization, uh, industrial and uh, industrial revolution was linked very much to slavery. And at a time in the 18th century, China, India, and Britain were at the same stage of development. But then Western, Western Europe took off, and, and the discussion, there's a lot of academic discussion around that. But imperialism as a term came into vogue in the early 20th century within the left. Lenin, Luxembourg, and Bukharin, and other, other, other leaders of the, uh, of the <coughs> communist movement. There are a lot of debates about imperialism at that time, and the theoretical and uh, empirical aspects of it. I don't want to go into that. I simply want to say that the leaders of the uh, left were correct in the political judgment, because there were two fundamental political uh, judgment that they made. One was to oppose the World World War, First World War, that it was not something that will benefit the working class, and support and uh, support and this is what is important in terms of racism. Supported the anti-colonial movements that was erupting uh, at that time, and at that time nobody was thinking, at least on the right or within the ruling class or even on the left, that independence would be there in 40 years' time. So they were very very clear about that. Those two things, and. And, and, and once decolonization happened 40 years later, uh, after the two world wars, uh, there was a space that was created uh, because of the uh, Soviet Union, because of the national liberation struggle. And Vijay has written eloquently about all of this in his books. 
uh, the moments of the non-capitalist path of development and the moments of non-aligned movement, which have been lost for, uh, for if not forever, for a considerable period of time. And then what we have in capitalism and imperialism are the various periods that we now uh, equate with uh, different phases of capitalism. After the Second World War, the period between 45 and 79, which is the Keynesian period, the period where uh, a settlement happened and which was broadly accepted of social democratic dominance, but there was a lot of communist uh, uh, possibilities in, in Western Europe, uh, let alone what happened in Eastern Europe. Then there was a period between 79 and 2008, which uh, which uh, in 2007, uh, eight, and after 2008, the, cri the crisis that have emerged. And what has happened is a shift in production, uh, global production uh, through outsourcing and export-oriented export uh, industrialization. But capitalism in, in, in the post-colonial countries also had characteristics which were very interesting. Uh, and which, which will form part of po the politics in future, the emergence of a huge informal sector in most of those countries. And my uh, experiences and my uh, <coughs> examples are mainly from South Asia, the informal sector that emerged, and the presence and the persistence of the presence of the peasantries in those countries. In, uh, at the present conjecture, these are throwing up interesting, interesting po uh, political uh, political ideas and political struggle. There has also been a new international uh, economic and political structure that has been set up. Uh, uh, the World Bank, the ADB, the WTO, International Monetary Fund, the Basel Bank of Settlements, the military pacts uh, through NATO, the G7, the European banks and EEC to underpin the political uh, dominance uh, of, of the, and the military dominance of the imperialist powers. And uh, the one thing that I'm avoiding at the moment is debates on monopoly inter, uh, competition and states uh, regarding imperialism, because that is not my concern at the moment. I want to go directly into politics. Uh, what we have now is global capital with the dominance of finance globally and nationally, the end of colonialism and the end of direct political control and a host of international legal and institutional structure with important economic relations through which important economic relations are expressed and enforced. The end of the Second World War also saw the advent of migrants from the ex-colonies, and I'll speak only from, from the UK experience. Earlier we had uh, migrants from uh, of Protestants, Huguenots from France, economic migrants and uh, migrants, political migrants uh, from, uh, from Eastern Europe. And after the Second World War, we had migrants from the ex-colonial countries. And now, in over the last two, two decades, we are having the blowback of imperialist wars in the Middle East. What we have to do in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, the uh, the migrants and the irrigation is that uh, what, what has been done is time and again the two types of ruling class set up. Lisa, sorry to interrupt you. Can you speak more into the microphone because people are having difficulty hearing you? Sorry to interrupt. Okay. And uh, draconian immigration laws were set up. With, uh, 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 in order to assimilate, assimilate the migrants to British way of life and to reward the human rights, uh, uh, race, policy, race policies. The left looked at racism and not race relations. Uh, we argued that anti-racism was inextricably linked with anti-imperialism. While liberals talked about identity, diversity, and racism awareness, the left examine the structural, material, and economic processes of institutional racism, racism, and they argue for the centrality of class, labor movement, and an international perspective. Today in UK, we can glimpse part of the future 
through some concrete instances of what is happening on the ground, we can see the deficiencies of the liberal diversity agenda when we have a conservative government with its most diverse cabinet in history, while they are proceeding over deepening injustices and waging a war on one. So that is what identity politics in some form has come to. And we also see on the ground the tension that is brewing up. Forget the tension between uh, part of the working class, part of the right wing mob uh, in, in UK and the migrants, but we also see tensions between South Asians within in the diaspora. And recently, we saw in Leicester what, ha what has happened, and the ruling class interest is always to keep the communities pitted against each other and to cultivate ethno nationalism and faith. We all remember what happened when the anti war movement started. Blair very quickly got the Muslim, big, good Muslims together into an organization, uh, uh, doled, out, uh, doled out various peerages and, a, uh, and justified a form of ethno nationalism and faith nationalism and tried to make those religious identities into a political, uh, political identity. This is something which is worrying and is increasing. And in order to, uh, to put a counter narrative, what we are trying to do uh, on the ground, the Communist Party of Britain, uh, various working class representatives of Indian Workers Association, Bangladesh Workers Council, and Pakistani labor movements, is to go beyond the religious, the ethnic, the anti American. Uh, not anti imperialist but anti American uh, identity politics and begin a task where keep, we bring together to, uh, together these various communities and link them with the labor movements of their own, uh, <coughs> own, own, own communities as well as the mainstream labor movement in this country, the trade unions, and everybody else. Well, we, at a, at a local level in East London, we have been trying to do that with uh, Bengalis from West Bengal in India and Bangladesh is from Bangladesh, Bengal is from Bangladesh in. And one of the things that we did is whenever a communal riot erupted anywhere in India, we immediately held a meeting proclaiming no ifs, no buts, defend the minorities. So the first thing was to unite them. So we, we, are, try, we are doing that uh, uh, on a regular level. Uh, there's a strong, very strong Islamist, political Islamic current in this country. They have in fact, part of them have captured the local uh, local authority in Tower Hamlets. Uh, not that uh, part of them are not uh, progressives, but doing that on, the, on that basis is not something we can support. And we are also trying to broaden that alliance uh, and bringing in other other sectors. And one of the one of the things that we have successfully done over the last ten years is to bring back history, bring back education, political education, and 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 to do that in Tower Hamlets. We choose on ca uh, Cable Street, the Battle of Cable Street, a struggle that the Communist Party led, a struggle that the Irish Wing class led, and the struggle that the broadest uh, conglomeration of the Jewish community led uh, in, in that area. And that area is now right in the heart of Bangladesh, Bangladeshi people, and that is something we are, we are doing. We also are very aware of nationalism as a recruiting ground. So we, on the, on the Brexit thing, uh, we did try to set up Lexit, which is the left exit from Europe. I know it was very controversial, because in order to connect with the with the white with the white working class, and it was difficult to do that, but we did that. And and at the moment, what we need to do is continuously argue for a class organization. In a on top of whether we start with. Uh, identity politics or not, we have to have some sort of class basis to that. In conclusion, uh, what I want to say is that uh, <clears throat> we have to build an anti imperialist movement, first of all, to engage in class struggle. And in order to engage and, and make the class struggle successful, we have to unite, unite the whole of the working class, which means the various diaspora, especially the South Asian diaspora and the Muslim diaspora. And and on that note, I will end. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Nisa, uh, for your contribution. Um, I'm sure that it will provoke a lot of thought amongst people. Um, just to remind folk, you can put questions in the Q&A uh, box and I will come to them after our next speaker, who is Vide Vijay Pradash, who is uh, well known to many of us, but I'll repeat, is the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, chief correspondent for Globetrotter and editor at Leftwood Books. Vijay, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to be with you. It's nice to see Nisar again. Um, I must say that um, you're having some real troubles in the United Kingdom. Um, just a few weeks ago, the European Union's head of diplomacy, Josef Bossels, made quite an extraordinary speech where he differentiated the world into jungles and gardens. He said, Europe is a garden and the rest of the world is a jungle. Well, a couple of points about that. One, of course, jungles are ecologically much better for the planet. Um, gardens are atrocious, uh, terrible, because they erase biodiversity. So maybe actually Bocelles was making an ecological critique of Europe and was misunderstood for being a racist. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's in his head. Um, also, it's interesting, this jungle garden business, because if by jungle he meant chaotic places around the world, um, and since now Britain has left Europe, maybe Britain is part of that jungle, finally. Uh, I know that Enoch Powell used to complain about this, but for different reasons, that there were too many migrants coming to, to uh, the UK from the former colonies. You know what Malcolm X said about um, racism in the United States? He said, uh, speaking as an African-American, he said, um, we never landed on Plymouth Rock. You see, Plymouth Rock is the place in Massachusetts where the so-called pilgrims landed. He said, we never landed at Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. Um, I think that's a pretty apposite statement. You know, uh, first the ships arrive from Europe and attempt to colonize the rest of the world. And when after having destroyed and impoverished those parts of the world, people say, well, I'm now going to go to the United Kingdom. You've said for centuries, it's the land of milk and honey. But when you arrive there, of course, um, you are treated as a subhuman uh, and in some cases put on planes and sent to, you know, Rwanda and so on. Uh, extraordinary situation in the United Kingdom these days, um, a mediocre elite. Uh, unable to actually find a person to hold it together. It demonstrates how mediocre the elite is in England. Um, really pathetic, you know, uh, that the only people they can put forward as their executive, remember Marx's terrific phrase uh, about the executive of the bourgeoisie being the governments of a capitalist state. Well, the only executives you can seem to find are people so pathetic, you know, Boris Johnson, um, Liz Truss, uh, and even the people who fought for those, uh, for that post, Rishi Sunak, I mean, for God's sake, Suella Braverman, I mean, where are these people coming from? Uh, you can't imagine, you know, I'm sitting in Santiago, Chile, everybody's laughing, you know, what's going on in that place? Um, I thought they had Oxford and Cambridge and they keep telling us that they are so much more intelligent than us and that they have higher education, the best higher education institutions. Well, what are they producing? Buffoons like Boris Johnson, um, you know, criminally minded racists like Sue Ella Braverman. And then there's the other problem. How come so many of these absolutely terrifying people are South Asian? Uh, Preeti Patel, Sue Ella Braverman, even Rishi Sunak. I mean, what's going on here? Extraordinary, you know, extraordinary the way in which uh, history moves. Well, I want to just take you know, my time to talk a little bit about both the rationality of racism and imperialism and the irrationality of it. Because in fact, racism and imperialism are both rational and irrational. Um, and we have to understand it like that. You know, there's no, I think, shame in calling racism quite rational uh, if we understand it structurally. It doesn't just exist um, you know, because some people are bad, uh, you know, liberals like to assume that a little bit more education 
and you can push people over the line and stop them being racist you know just a little bit more multicultural uh, inoculation you know we're going to uh, have a um, have a uh, uh, you know vaccine for racism we'll just inoculate them with a little more blairite multiculturalism and all will be well it doesn't quite work like that and we know it doesn't you know that even these people who fashion themselves as great champions of multiculturalism in the end, in the end of the day, quite happy uh, to send weapons to Saudi Arabia to destroy Yemen, quite happy to join wars against Libya and so on. Uh, their multiculturalism, uh, to put it plainly, is skin deep. Well, the irrational part of racism is the inheritance uh, that's hard to slough off. That's the inheritance of colonialism. You know, so many hundreds of years of establishing um, you know, certain peoples as inferior and certain peoples as superior uh, takes a toll on a culture. It, uh, in a sense, it damages the culture. A European culture is damaged by colonialism. It, it will be damaged for a very long time uh, until it comes to terms with its own colonial past. Right now, there's pure denial. Um, you know, the former uh, king, I mean, for God's sake, you still have kings and queens. It's extraordinary. The former king went to Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar. Um, I so did a former prime minister. Um, I think David Cameron was then the scoundrel uh, in that chair, went to Jallianwala Bagh and they refused to apologize for an open massacre when you know General Dyer sends in his uh, troops and they open fire on hundreds of unarmed people uh, who were in a public meeting to talk about the defense of India rules in 1919. Not even apology for that. Forget everything else. Forget the trillions stolen from India. Uh, forget the, the abomination of the so-called slave trade and so on. Uh, Britain is, will never be able to uh, you know, transcend the damage done to its culture unless children in educational institutions are taught the truth about the colonial um, story, you know, about who Winston Churchill really was, um, and so on and so forth. So the culture is damaged, and there needs to be a public acknowledgement of it. Simply by talking about multiculturalism isn't actually going to heal the damage in British culture, in European culture. You'll always have a Joseph Bossels saying things like, you know, the rest of the world is a jungle and Europe is a garden. That kind of racism. The tonic for that isn't some sort of liberal blanket over it. The tonic for that is to go deep into the culture, acknowledge the damage that has been done to it by colonialism, because that damage is significant. In that sense, um, racism is irrational. It has damaged the culture of people uh, in, 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 in parts of Europe, very many parts of Europe, and certainly in North America. It has damaged the culture. And in that sense, irrational, it can be healed. Uh, but there's a rational element to racism. And I, I'll give you a couple of examples, perhaps offer a few words about why I believe that racism is rational uh, in, in a capitalist system. And then I, I hope we'll have a, a good discussion. Well, two quick examples. One, 1984 in Bhopal, in, in, in India, central India, there was a terrible explosion in, in, at night in October. Um, this explosion was at a, at a chemical plant uh, owned by Union Carbide, a US factory. Union Carbide later owned by Dow Chemicals. Dow Chemicals, you might know, was the manufacturer of Agent Orange, which was dropped with absolute impunity on the people of Vietnam, destroying the Ho Chi Minh Trail, what was called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, so that if you ever travel to central Vietnam, you'll see parts of the country can't have agriculture for generations as a consequence of that chemical warfare by the United States against the Vietnamese people. Well, Union Carbide had a factory in, in Bhopal and it exploded and several thousand people died. Um, over time, because of the uh, terrible gas that leaked from the factory, many more thousands died. Uh, many more thousands, tens of thousands, in fact, had their lives greatly impacted by the explosion. Okay. Um, the Indian courts uh, called for the head of Union Carbide to come and face charges of negligence. Because after all, documents leaked quite immediately to show that Union Carbide was aware 
of problems at the factory. But they basically said, no, it's fine. You know, it'll be okay. Another 10 years, another five years. We don't need to do basic maintenance uh, on this factory, even though Indian regulators sanctioned them and told them they had to. So there was a record for all this. They completely neglected it. The man who was head of Union Carbide hid in Long Island in, in New York. Um, he never uh, was uh, willing to come to India. Uh, like fugitives from justice from other parts of the world, you know, he just hid there. Well, um, the New York Times did a story where they went and talked to other chemical industry people about this terrible tragedy. And I was struck uh, by the New York Times story because a executive for a company called American Sinamed said the following. He said that the number of dead in Bhopal should not be taken too seriously because Indians do not share the North American philosophy of the importance of human life. Indians do not share the North American philosophy of the importance of human life. In other words, um, an Indian life is not worth the same as a life of a person in North America. Uh, certainly perhaps not as much as a person in the UK. Um, this kind of algebra of human life is not just for American Sinamid, it's there in wars. We see that now. Um, how many of you know what the Iraqi flag looks like? Or how many of you know what the Yemeni flag looks like or the Libyan flag or indeed the Palestinian flag? But everybody seems to know what a Ukrainian flag looks like because um, white dead are in fact much more precious than brown dead or black dead. Um, people don't know the color of the Congo, the flag of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Millions of people dead in a war over resources uh, where external powers are essentially keeping the Congo destabilized so that all its minerals can be leached out. But how many of you have put the Congolese flag as your Facebook profile? Or where in London do people fly these flags? Not at all. Ukrainian flag. They are uh, children with blonde hair and blue eyes, and their life is much more precious than the life of an Iraqi child. Perhaps two million Iraqis killed by the US war, not even near that number in Ukraine. And yet there is so much outrage at what's happening in Ukraine. And there was almost no outrage. Uh, Tony Blair, that war criminal, uh, sanctimoniously lecturing us about human rights now. Millions dead in Iraq. You know, I covered the Iraq war. I saw the detritus of that war. And for me, this is a personal issue as well. I find it horrifying how the world so quickly uh, got seized, or at least the Western world, about what was happening in Ukraine still till today, absolute disregard for Iraqi lives. So one, it's utterly rational uh, for capitalism, as I'm going to give you with a second example, because why should an American company uh, do upkeeps? Why should it use its capital to um, regulate and keep uh, you know, within safety rules, a factory in India, because if the factory explodes, they're just Indian lives. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, they don't have the North American philosophy of life. In that sense, rational. Union Carbide saved a lot of money by not improving the factory. They made a lot of profit and then the factory explodes and people die and, you know, that's their lot. They believe in reincarnation. They'll come back at some point. What do we care about their life? Second example, Haiti. Now very much in the news, um, 2009, the wretched Haitian parliament, even at the time, you know, Haiti had a democratic process, a great movement of democracy in the 1980s. Jean-Bertrand Aristide elected in, in, the, in the constitution of 1987, coup in 1991, Jean-Bertrand Aristide returns, coup in 2004. Aristide is the only um, person I know in world history who's been twice cooed by the United States, uh, which should earn him a place in the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, these two coups against Aristide devastated Haiti's politics. So, but even this wretched parliament in 2009 attempted to raise a minimum wage for Haitian workers, uh, saying that, you know, we've got to go um, uh, at least to five US dollars a day. 90% of Haiti's um, exports are in the garment sector, largely going to the US, you know, making sweatshirts and things like that. Haitian workers were getting pennies uh, on the dollar. The sweatshirts retail for 40, 50, 60, 70 US dollars. Haitian worker for stitching that would get less than $1, um, uh, you know, or so, you know, one or $2 a day, making hundreds of these sweatshirts. So imagine the amount of 
a super exploitation taking place in Haiti. Haitian parliament says, let's lift it to $5, you know, a very modest increase. The US government intervenes. And we only know this thanks to the WikiLeaks Corporation, uh, Julian Assange sitting in Belmarsh prison for telling us the truths of the world, a great scandal. Uh, West keeps talking about, you know, press freedom in other countries. Meanwhile, Assange is a standing rebuke uh, against the claims of press freedom in the West. Anyway, um, you know, WikiLeaks revealed to us that the US government intervenes. David Lindwall, former US Deputy Chief of Mission in Port-au-Prince, writes a note uh, to Hillary Clinton's State Department saying that um, the Haitian attempt to raise the minimum wage did not take economic reality into account, it says. Economic reality into account. What's that reality? That the big garment manufacturers must make super profits and Haitian workers must live for nothing, with nothing. Uh, that's the economic reality of the US government. But then he goes on to say, he says this bill to raise the minimum wage is an attempt to appease the unemployed and underpaid masses. A very interesting phrase in a US government internal document. Um, they were trying to lift the wages to appease the underemployed and underpaid masses. My friends, I thought that is precisely what democracy is about, to take care of the um, underpaid and unemployed masses. That's what a capitalist democracy we keep getting told is about, improving the conditions of people, blah, blah, blah. In fact, the opposite in this case, US government suppressing wages in Haiti. By the way, those underpaid and underemployed masses are now on the streets in Haiti and have been so since 2016. Uh, from 2018 onwards, there have been four years of sustained protest in Haiti. Uh, now, instead of saying, let's improve the conditions of the lives of the people of Haiti, they want a military intervention. Um, you know, you, you don't want to improve the conditions in the world. You want to in intervene militarily, bomb them, don't feed them. That's the adage. That's the rationality of capitalist racism. The Haitians don't deserve high wages because after all, they don't like the Indians share the North American philosophy of human life. They just need to eat a little ball of rice or something, sit on the side of the road, um, perhaps smoke a cigarette or something. You don't need to improve their conditions of leisure. You don't have to give them leisure time. If you give them leisure time, they might organize themselves into a communist party. They organize themselves into a communist party. They may actually create a people's government. They may want to exercise sovereignty over their country. They may want to improve the conditions of dignity of the people. If that happens, we'll coup them, as Elon Musk so delightfully said. You try to establish sovereignty, will coo you. That's the rationality of capitalist racism. So again, to sum up, it's irrational. It has damaged your culture. It has damaged your culture and you must be fighting to actually improve the status of your culture. It is rooted in the culture of the global north. Racism is taken deep root. You have to go dig in there and get the weeds out. Um, just by pulling the weeds or playing with the weeds, on the surface with multiculturalism is not enough. You have to dig out the weeds. It has damaged your culture in that sense, irrational, but also rational because rationally it justifies the super exploitation of the vast mass of people around the world. There it is. Imperialism, it's not just some bad guys doing something. It's a world system. Um, yes, send Tony Blair to The Hague. Let him face charges for the war in Iraq. But it's not just Tony Blair. What about those wealthy bondholders who have now established themselves uh, as, the, as the disloyal opposition of the Conservative Party and brought down the trust government? Uh, mark my words, it was not the Labour Party that brought down the trust government. It was the actual opposition in the UK, which is the capitalist bondholders who punished the government. Uh, you know, how are we going to expose them, not one by one, but as a class? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vide, and let me apologize for mispronouncing your name. It's of course Prashad, uh, and not what I happen to uh, mumble into the microphone, so apologies for that. We have a number of questions um, that have come in. I'm gonna take one that came in quite early on. Did World War II mark the beginning of the end of political colonialism and the beginning of economic colonialism. Nisa, would you like to have a go at answering that question? 
Uh, no, is the first answer. I mean, political colonialism, cultural colonialism, economic colonialism has stayed uninterrupted throughout the two, three hundred years that we have that uh, relationship between a part of the world and another part of the world. Uh, what happened is direct political control uh, uh, eased, and uh, different countries became liberated or became independent depending on the type of movement that uh, uh, that happened before that. Uh, uh, in South Asia is one case, there are various countries in Africa, uh, it happened in different ways, uh, different countries in other areas happened in different ways. And But what happened is, after the Second World War, a situation was created globally, where you had what we used to call the First World, Second World, and the Third World. You had the First World, which was the developed capitalist countries, the Second World, which was Soviet Union and, and, and the other socialist countries, which was there from, from 1945 onwards, for nearly uh, 40 years, 40, 45 years. And that created a, a system of political power where some of the independent countries could maneuver their economic and political position. And the best example of that is, uh, is the North and I countries. And the best example of that in terms of economic, economic, uh, uh, economic policy was the role of the state in some of those countries, whether it was Egypt, India, or, or, or Indonesia. And we can go into discussions about or the rights and wrongs of those organizations, what the role of the left was, should they have taken this position or that position, but that space was there. So until 1995 or even um, 1980, and especially after 1995, that that ceased. From then onwards until now, it is not unipolar, but at least economic, the economic and politics have again, again come back together until the outburst of uh, right-wing politics in the in the heartlands. So no, it didn't start and end. It, it is an uninterrupted, continued uh, continued uh, role, but it had its ups and downs, and there are different lessons to be drawn from that, depending on the country that you uh, you are in. I mean, I'll give you a short example in terms of, uh, even at that, at the time of independence in, in India, for example, at the time of independence, there was communalism. People were killing each other. I mean, uh, the uh, British exploited that, British induced that. But in Bengal, which was at that time undivided, there was peasant struggle, massive peasant struggle called Sibhaza Andhra which was incredibly powerful. So powerful that even in a country at that time, which became independent Pakistan, which was a Muslim rule, and the Eastern part was, was also Muslim rule, and they had voted for uh, Pakistan. Even in that country, the uh, uh, peasant struggle was incredibly successful to the extent that even now people talk about that. And interestingly enough, a part of the communist movement, or big part of the communist movement, was led by Hindus. And Hindus were supposed to be the enemy. And uh, my point is that if genuine class of struggle from the bottom comes up, even at times of mayhem, you can make breaks. And, and I think that is always a, a notice stuff to us in terms of organizing politics, wherever we are. Thank you. Thank you, Nissa. Vijay, would you like to respond to the question? I mean, frankly, I think that. Um, both political and economic factors have been there all through. Um, I don't think that there's a major break with World War II. Um, I mean, you know, these things are deeply intertwined, the political and the economic, um, and it's difficult to pass them out. So, for instance, um, take the case of, of countries like Zambia today. Zambia is a is a sovereign country um, in terms of it's, you know, got a government, it has a seat in the United Nations and so on. It's one of the richest countries in the world in terms of per capita, in terms of its uh, resources. Yet Zambian people are extraordinarily poor. Uh, why is that so? Um, when the government of Zambia uh, attempts to move an agenda, uh, it gets pushed back from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, it gets pushed back from bondholders and so on. 
and they surrender. They don't fight this. Uh, they allow transfer mispricing. They allow the plunder of their balance of payments. Uh, they allow really bad deals to be written so that 60% of the children who live above the copper reserves have no access to good education. They are in fact almost functionally illiterate. How is that possible? Well, Zambia is politically independent, but it actually can't exercise its sovereignty. Um, Burkina Faso, another country uh, where Thomas Sankara comes to power in 1983, attempts to exercise the sovereignty of the country, attempts to create uh, agricultural systems to make Burkina Faso, the Burkinabe people, uh, self-sufficient in food, and then he is assassinated. And there's a coup, and Blaise Compare comes and just continues the subordination of Burkina Faso to the French and to the Europeans in general. So, you know, this idea of, of more economic power after World War II or, uh, is not actually the case because many countries are not able to exercise their political sovereignty even. Um, you know, Cuba under blockade since 1959, uh, unable to, or, well, trying its best to exercise its political sovereignty um, against uh, enormous pressure from uh, the imperialist powers. So I just think there's no need to divide these things. You know, they, they are dialectical and one has to see them like that. Thank you, Vijay. Um, and thank you, uh, Nissan, for that. Moving on to the next question. This is from Benjamin Pugh. Question for Vijay. Uh, in the context of building better connections with the British Indian community against Hindutava in the UK, do you see a benefit to British Marxists sharing the successes and challenges for this, the Communist Party of India Marxists in power? And he adds, being seen to celebrate the successes of our Indian comrades. Vijay. I mean, I would like you to celebrate the success of uh, the Indian comrades, of course, especially, um, you know, the communist movement, the CPIM, the actually quite extraordinary um, advances made in Kerala, a state of 36 odd million people, which weathered the pandemic better than many places. Um, the building of a public life in Kerala is very important. Um, you know, they have rescued the collective life. Uh, during the pandemic, young people went out onto the streets um, in the city of Trivandrum, took clipboards, went door to door as members of the Democratic Youth Federation of India. Uh, they asked people, do you have any needs? Do you have any wants? What's the problem? Uh, amongst those young people, as a consequence of this extraordinarily compassionate act during the, the early days of the pandemic, one of them, Arya Rajendran, age 21, a young woman, uh, won the, the, the um, post of mayor of the capital city of Kerala. So the capital of Kerala is governed by a young woman in her early 20s uh, who is a communist. And she won that post not because of some election machine, but because she and her comrades in the Democratic Youth Federation went door to door um, you know, and they raised the confidence of people that they were not going to just die in their homes, you know, as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, that kind of rescuing the collective life, those stories must be shared. Uh, what did the Modi government do? Modi government on behalf of Hindutva asked people to stand on their balconies and bang pots and pans. Um, you know, we didn't see the Hindu right go out and do this kind of compassionate politics. So by all means, share these lessons, but also learn from them. Um, you know, in the UK, uh, the Johnson government, as you know, was uh, as catastrophic as Modi, as Trump, as others in dealing with the pandemic, as catastrophic. Um, what did we do? You know, uh, what did we as the left do? Uh, I am of the view that we in the communist movement cannot just be the critics of capitalism. We have to be already building socialism. Uh, you know, socialism in the future will only contain in it what you put into it now. So we have to be doing these things now. We have to be going door to door, being compassionate now. Uh, our socialism is compassionate. I'm always discomforted by the use of that phrase that emanates from the United States, compassionate conservatism. There's no such thing as compassionate conservatism. Conservatism is cruel. It's socialism that's compassionate. And we need to demonstrate it now. Thank you, Vijay. Nisar, would you like to say anything here? 
You're muted. Yes. No, I endorse what you what you said, and that's fine. Okay, thank you, Nisa. Moving on to another question. Um, this is from Sarah Whitaker. Capitalist countries propagandize their populations into outright ignorance of existing socialist states and entire continents, such as Africa with its rich history. Kwame Ture argued that a major problem of the movement is confronting this propaganda and pushing through it. How best do you think we can push past miseducation and propaganda in the current age? Nisa. You're, it's all right, you're unmuted. Nisa? Yeah, uh, the best, the best uh, is for any, any country, uh, I don't know, but for any country, the thing is education. You know, some of the things that uh, Vijay was saying in the last, and answer to the last question, that we need to, need to give counter narratives, need to use words, need to say things that are happening. For example, uh, there is a lot of talk uh, regarding South Asia about communalism. I'm bringing South Asia because that's the area I know best after UK and Europe. What is happening is that there is a lot of uh, communalism churning uh, churning around, both in, in in the cultural field, in the economic field, and in the political field. But what is missing is the struggles that ordinary people are doing in those countries. I mean, very recently, there has been a, a magnificent struggle by tea workers in Bangladesh. Tea workers who get very, very basic, hardly any wages, and are treated in the way they were treated 150 years ago but the one that struggled. There has been an incredible struggle by government workers, which is so linked with everything that is happening in, in Western Europe at the moment at, a, at an economic level. Again, uh, it, this is being touted as a great success story of Bangladesh in terms of economic development. But what is not pointed out is the struggles for getting basic human rights through trade unions, uh, in getting a minimum wage which gives them a livable, livable, uh, uh, livable way of living. And in order to, uh, those struggles are happening on a day-to-day -day basis, but these are not getting, getting, getting through. Perhaps uh, this can be done. I don't know about the specific thing, but can be done. Can be done if we can set up alternative streams of of uh, of uh, social uh, social communication and social media. I am not an expert on, on technology, but I think technology has a role to play. Thank you. Thanks, Nisa. Vijay? You see, I, I'm of the view that we have to also build our own organizations and build the capacity of our organizations to become our own media. Um, you know, it's impossible. Um, to replicate the media of the capitalist bloc. We simply will never have the resources to do that in the current conjuncture. You know, I'm not going to be able to um, create the kind of television channels and the TV channels and even the websites um, that they create, you know, um, mischievously using the algorithms to advantage them and so on. We can't compete there, but where we can compete is we have to build our organizations and we have to train through political education, our own cadre to be the mouthpiece of our own movement and views. Uh, that's a funny business. You know, I go on Facebook sometimes and I see our own comrades sharing things from, you know, um, the Murdoch press or sharing things from the New York Times. I mean, you know, you've got to be reading like the Morning Star and you've got to be uh, out there uh, sharing things from these uh, places, these small voices that are trying to offer an alternative. Um, and so I think, you know, we have to come to terms with the fact that we have to be our own media um, and, and, and therefore counter propaganda in that way. But it's much more than that. It's not just about, um, you know, countering propaganda. 
uh, it's also about lifting up the stories of people from faraway places. Um, and that's very important. You know, let's take an example. Um, it's very easy for the United Kingdom to be sanctimonious, for instance, about the war in Ukraine. Very easy. Why is it so easy? That's because nobody in the United Kingdom knows that, for instance, the people, the Chagos Islanders of what is known as Diego Garcia have been utterly removed from their homeland in order for the British to build a base in the Indian Ocean, which they've given over to the United States, you know, sanctimoniously talking about, um, you know, how people's self-determination must be, um, you know, uh, um, uh, validated, how the United Kingdom stands on the side of justice. If the United Kingdom stood on the side of justice, then disband the U.S. base in Diego Garcia and hand the land back to the Chagos Islanders. That's a small example. We can go to the Malvinas Island, which you call the Falklands. Um, you know, it's about time that Malvinas goes back to the people of Argentina. A uh, very simple question. Why does the U.K., why did the U.K. under Margaret Thatcher fight a really stupid war to hold on to an island which is so far away from its territory? Um, but that's the old colonial heritage. You know, here's Russia and Ukraine, they border each other. They are facing a severe a crisis of security and, and, and the determination of each other's, uh, you know, uh, borders and whatever ethnic claims and so on. But there's no such ethnic claim with the Malvinas, you know, which for God's sake is at the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, the other side of the world, in fact. Um, so if you don't know about your own history, it's easy to be sanctimonious about other people's present. Um, you got to know about your own history. You know, uh, look, uh, it, it's a funny business. There were these U.S. drone strikes in Waziristan. Um, I don't know if people, and that's in northern Pakistan bordering Afghanistan. People don't even maybe know that the British had over 100 years ago conducted terrible aerial bombardment of those very areas. Um, you know, aerial bombardment that had uh, people like T.E. Lawrence, so-called Lawrence of Arabia, um, you know, based out there in, in Waziristan, later Winston Churchill calling the people savages and in need of a small dose of bombardment. I mean, you've got to know your own history. If you don't know your history, as I said, you will be sanctimonious about other people's present. You know, why are they doing these terrible things? For God's sake, nobody believes you. Uh, nobody believes you when you talk like that, Liz. Nobody believes you. You sound like a joke. When you stand there and say, we are against Russia's illegal war against Ukraine. Okay, against Russia's illegal war against Ukraine. What about the UK's illegal war against Iraq? Uh, when is that going to be put on the table and settled? Uh, so sanctimonious. And I think that's the heart of it, is that you've got to know your own history. How do we do that? You have to campaign to change the history books. I would recommend people to join the Jallianwala Bagh committee. Uh, which has for a long time under the leadership of the Indian Workers Association uh, been campaigning in parliament and so on, trying to get the United Kingdom to put just the story of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre into the books. What about the emergency period in Malaya? That needs to be taught to children. What about the, uh, the terrible emergency period in Kenya? That needs to be taught to children. Um, you have to campaign to change the school curriculum, uh, not just that we become our own media, but you must campaign on that. Thank you, Vijay. Um, moving on to another question, but before I do, can I just say to comrades, please put your, even your comments into the Q&A uh, um, and questions, please. Right, the next question is, Britain remains an imperialist power and as the recent TUC Congress shows, some unions support the building of arms. How can we build a genuine anti-racist and anti-imperialist movement in Britain? Vijay, do you want to answer first? Well, it's a question actually for you, Ruth, not for me, because this <laughs> is a question of, this is your jurisdiction, uh, not mine. Uh, but I can say something general about this. Um, look, it's quite, understandable for a trade union to say, well, we want jobs. Um, after all, that's the trade union consciousness. Uh, I learned that lesson reading Lenin's What is to be done, where Lenin says, don't be surprised by sometimes the limitation of a trade union's position, because 
that's called economism they take a, a certain view based on what they see as the immediate needs of the workers so that's a very narrow approach a very wrong approach politically but i can understand why a union takes that position but it's politically and morally extraordinarily weak uh, but maybe they want to only think about the jobs of their workers okay uh, fine but let me ask the trade union leadership the following um, you want to build submarines and bombs and so on why don't you convert those factories to rebuild the british rail system which is deteriorating why don't you use that ingenuity and technology to create better public transportation uh, convert your buses to natural gas uh, why don't you um, you know use that ingenuity to get people uh, more uh, efficient heating for their homes and for buildings and so on why don't you fight for that why don't you fight for conversion uh, from defense so called defense arms industry uh, to non arms industry because after all you can protect your jobs and build a different world uh, you know the last time i was in the uk i was quite surprised by how poor the trains were and i was very surprised by the really shoddy condition of the roads um, i'm not in favor of roads i would like to ban cars and move everybody particularly in a small country like like the uk to trains you know you you, you don't need cars you can have an entirely train society um, but the trains are in such bad shape and privatization of british rail has been extraordinarily inefficient outcome uh, for people so the unions can quite easily lead on this uh, protecting jobs yes but perhaps fighting for conversion but they're not thinking politically they are merely thinking in, as in an economistic way uh, that is only protect jobs well but remember that people can build good trains and also have jobs they don't just have to build nuclear submarines uh, for jobs there are other kinds of jobs available uh, and i suppose that has to be a fight from the broader political landscape towards the unions uh, the unions themselves are not going to self necessarily not necessarily self generate um, you know some sort of uh, political agenda now obviously we have excellent comrades in the union movement many of them fighting to the last vote uh, my great comrade alex gordon and th so on in the tuc fighting right till the end to 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 you know push these positions forward but again they must be supported politically from outside uh, and therefore there has to be a people's movement that calls for conversion from weapons manufacturing to um, to building up the infrastructure of a declining island and let me say one last thing about that forget manufacturing for the united kingdom the uk allows uh, israeli manufacturing firms like elbit systems to manufacture on british soil i'm so proud of the young people in palestinian action who take direct action to try and shut down elbit systems and i very much hope they get all the support that they need thank you vj nissa <clears throat> two things one is that there is a excellent sorry this is propaganda for the party one thing is that there is an excellent excellent pamphlet by the communist party and uh, and tony who is here who is one of the authors and there is also a equally ex excellent uh, long review of that pamphlet in morning star i will give the details where we discuss all these things in a, in a in a very detailed way both the pamphlet and then i recommend that to all the comrades who were here the one thing that i will say i want to just raise one issue which gets lost because that issue is not simply something about europe it is all over the country which is the hold of nationalism or patriotism or the desire for empire in advanced capitalist countries or or, or some sort of nationalism with an ethnic or faith nationalism in 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 less developed or post colonial capitalist countries this is an issue that we can't shirk away from whether it is the hindutva of india whether it is bolsonaro whether erdogan whether it is and one of the things that they are doing is clamping down in a big way on democracy and one of the things that they are also trying to tell us is that we are anti american anti west so and that gets the hearing and we have to think of smart ways of combating that otherwise even in a place 
we talk about Kerala, we talk about West Bengal. I mean, West Bengal, the Hindu Java Brigade is already there on our doors. I, I, there is no reason why it should not be in Kerala. And, and, and we have to think not only theoretically, but also in terms of what people are thinking. One of the things that I constantly say to comrades on the ground is that we have to be where the people are, not where we are. Just because we are uh, internationalists, just because we are serious internationalists, we have to begin from somewhere. We cannot begin from internationalism. We have to begin from somewhere and we have to hear what people are saying. And that is why I think what is happening now in some of the countries, in post-colonial countries, is that the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, are going in a big way and are getting a hearing within the communist movement, within the left movement. And that hearing is that it's not possible for us to do everything at, at one go. Let us start here and, and let us build what we have here and have now let us have capitalism with the human face. But I will reiterate what Vijay has said, which is that it's not only that we're interested in capitalism with the human face, then the NGO brigade will come. What we want is socialism here and now. And we have to look at the struggles that are developing, the new forms of structures that are developing, uh, in, in where they're talking about handling power in a, in a, in a particular industry, or a particular factory. And those must be taken in tandem with the political struggles around communalism or nationalism or imperialism or around elections. Thank you. Thank you, Nisa. Just a couple of things I will say um, on this is that the view of the Communist Party has always been that the best way to build an anti-racist, anti-fascist movement in this country is local community activity and building and working with united communities around this issue. It builds in resilience and it actually then develops into a much broader movement. So comrades who are asking this question perhaps want to look at their own local communities and see whether there is an opportunity for them to work locally with local groups and build. It's the only way we can do it. Okay, moving on, um, just again to remind people, if you want to ask a question, please put it in the chat. We're, we're running uh, towards the last 25 minutes or so of the meeting. Taking another question, um, let me see where it is, sorry. Oh, I seem to have lost this question. Oh, here it is. There is talk about the reformation of the non-aligned movement. Is this a realistic proposition? Vijay. Well, to be fair, the non-aligned movement has not gone away as such. Um, it, it was founded in 1961 in Belgrade, continues to meet. Um, it continues to put forward its positions and so on. You know, each of these groupings are only as powerful as the kind of, uh, you know, power of the individual countries and also their collective project. If there's a kind of belief in the collective project, um, the non-aligned movement has actually had some fissures open up, obviously, um, you know, a greater after the fall of the Soviet Union, a large section of the countries of the global south, which comprise the majority of the non-aligned movement, uh, almost surrendered to the unipolarity of the United States and that weakened the non-aligned movement. But then, um, you know, the contradictions of the period after the fall of the USSR developed its own momentum and you had several kinds of developments and I'd like to just talk about a few of them. One of them was as a consequence of, of the kind of um, unfair trade and development regime set up by the West um, in the 2000s, you saw the emergence of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, China, India, South Africa. Well, these are the large countries of the non-aligned movement. You know, when you talk about Brazil, South Africa, India, these are the largest countries um, in their continents. Uh, well, India close to China. Um, and, you know, the non-aligned movement, in a sense, had already this in its pathway uh, in 
um, the the South Commission report, which had been chaired by Julius Nerere, which was released in 1989, they talked about the need to create locomotives of the South. In other words, to revitalize the non-aligned movement. Even in 1989, they said the large countries need to create a block, uh, you know, in, a, in to revitalize. So that's that's one thing that has happened. The second thing that has happened is that countries that have been heavily sanctioned by the United States um, last year in 2021 created the group of friends in defense of the charter of the United Nations. You know, this includes, it was actually put forward by Venezuela. It includes Cuba, Nicaragua, Eritrea, Russia, China, and so on. You can read about it. It's called the group of friends in defense of the charter of the United Nations. Now, that's another block within the non-aligned movement. One is the BRICS, second is the group of friends. The third development that we are seeing, which is the actual movement of history, is the development towards regionalism. Um, in Latin America, for instance, this has been quite advanced. Uh, there was first the ALBA project proposed by Hugo Chavez, and then Lula developed a block called the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, CELAC, which kind of died away and has now been revived by Mexico's president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. So that's um, regionalism in Latin America. In Asia, at the heart of Asia, the Chinese in 2001 created a grouping called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, initially, they came together to basically put the finger on the Taliban, you know, to try to deal with the question of the Taliban before the attack on the United States. Um, then the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, sort of withered away. It was revived by the Chinese, bringing in uh, India as a full member, Russia, most of the Central Asian states, now Iran, Pakistan, uh, Turkey has applied for membership and so on. These are regional groupings. So, as I said, there have been three different ways that we must see uh, the revitalization of the NAM agenda. One is by the so-called locomotives of the South, and that's the kind of BRICS thing that you'll see um, if Lula wins on Sunday in the Brazilian elections, he is pledged to try to revitalize um, the, the BRICS. Uh, that's one. Secondly, is, as I said, the emergence of um, the group of friends led by Venezuela. And the third is regionalism. I think these are the fulcrum of the revitalization of the NAM. Just a point on this, if I may, Ruth, um, there's a lot of talk these days about multipolarity uh, rather than unipolarity. Personally and politically, I think this is an error. This concept is an error because multipolarity is something that the West actually would like. Uh, because this is an intensification of rivalries. You know, there's a poll in Beijing, a poll in Washington, poll in Moscow, and there'll be rivalry. No, in fact, the Chinese have been very clear. They are not uh, comfortable with the idea of multipolarity. I agree with them. What we want is we want a singular world, which is governed by the UN Charter of 1945, where illegal actions by the US government are no longer allowed, uh, where everybody has to ob oblige themselves to follow the various treaties including you know the treaties on climate and so on human rights um, social rights and and other, and other things uh, we we don't want to live in a multipolar world you know broken up into sections where there's great competitions and so on we want to advance a human agenda uh, the dilemmas of humanity have to be su uh, uh, supplanted that's why actually it's more adequate to talk of this as the age of regionalism than the age of multipolarity Thank you, VJ. Nisa? The only thing that I will add there is, I mean, the regional thing is very, very important, and that is how it will happen. But the issue, how does the left orient itself in individual countries to this, these movements? Because unless we have a central task, which is to oppose imperialism, and which is to oppose capitalist production in our own countries. Uh, how do you appraise this, uh, uh, these various formations that are happening regionally? The problem that I see is that it might happen that somebody will come up from the left and say, this is progressive, this is left-wing, this is anti-imperialist. And then you get into a debate and you get divided. 
and and that danger of division is always there whenever something like this is imposed from the above so, and that is why things ca- coming from the from below in terms of uh, uh, for example movements that are happening all over the world around resources movements that are happening all over the world around climate change movements that are happening all over the world around how do you how do you divide water resources what do you do about the legality of water resources these i think are important are more important and we should tie and link this with the things that are happening uh, beyond us and above us which will keep happening until we take a step forward wherever we can thank you nisa um somebody in the q and a has drawn attention to the situation in west papua indonesia and saying the war is about indonesian colonialism towards west papuan people who are black um and describes some of the uh, experiences of rape abuse murder and a high level of racism by indonesian soldiers and special forces and the police um i think the objective the, the contribution is to draw attention to this and for people in the in the left and elsewhere to research this and to provide some degree of support and to raise the issue more broadly um so i'll just leave it there um i have a, another question which i've just lost <laughs> i'm sorry from um sir witika existing socialist states have a good record of combating racism and producing some of the strongest bonds of international solidarity in the world a good example of this is vietnam and laos what lessons do you think we can learn from these movements both in the past and the present to apply to our own movements um vj um yeah i mean of course we must learn from them uh i think we have to be open to learning from all movements but um i mean i think that here the greatest lesson is in the struggle uh, because different contexts will provide a very different you know necessary forms that will emerge out of uh, out of the struggle so yeah i mean one can look at these matters uh, but you know the ethnic and 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 uh, those questions are different very different from the history of vietnam or the history of laos than say in the united kingdom so i would say by all means read study and so on but we won't be able to uh, draw a road map as such uh, you know the reason to learn about all this is to fight against the propaganda that socialism uh, doesn't address these issues that it's eurocentric and so on so i would look at it from that point of view it's it's very good to know about this so that we can advance the position against the attack on socialism but i don't know if we learn lessons as such thank you vj nisa uh, <clears throat> again i agree with that that we learn lessons but also there are lessons that sometimes you have forgotten for example the all the great anti fascist movement both in europe and in 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 south asia uh, started on a cultural level and there was a cafe in in covent garden where two intellectuals from india uh, one of them was the uh, was the first uh, uh, secretary of the pakistan communist party sajja jahir sat down and responded to the call of the british uh, communist ralph fox as well as other intellectuals in europe and created the anti fascist writers front and the anti fascist uh, uh, play, uh, play rights for for in, in india and 2 3 years later they went to india and created that and it was not an economic analysis it was not a political movement but it was a cultural movement that made the communist party in india a mass party similarly here uh, that happened and if we can revive that for example in the struggles that we are having today on the streets in leicester or on on the problems about jews and muslims in in east london then we can create spaces where culture can sometimes drive the politics and economics and not the other way around and we should take advantage of those situations and perhaps the uh, vietnam last thing uh, uh, gives us uh, some inspiration but i agree to some to the reaction with vijay that we should not be enamored of that that something suddenly will happen and something great will happen 
but there are instances where it has moved mountains. Thank you, Nisa. Um, I'm going to take what I think will probably be now the final question, uh, which is from Thomas Haywood. Is there any way to change the system of Western denial over the shocking exploitations and massacres of imperialism? Vijay. I mean, what is one to say uh, about that? Uh, I mean, uh, I would maybe Nisar should answer this question honestly. I, I I'm not sure what to say about that. Okay, Nisa. Yeah, I uh, to me it is something like this. I uh, the best way to do is at least uh, in terms of uh, UK or uh, in terms of England, the best way to do that is to mock and deride and laugh, yeah, uh, and basically say. You might deny this, but we we want to. Uh, you know the uh, quotation that you remember that Gandhi apparently said when he was asked about British civilization, he said it is a good idea. I mean something on those lines that which mocks at the thing, which doesn't take seriously their pretensions, because at at, at the moment there is so much evidence and so much uh, work that has been done that to still deny is is, is so ridiculous and it's unbelievable. So there must be a comic way of, of, of deriding and overcoming it. But what is also important is, is and this is where class comes in, where Marxism comes in, is that, you know, all Indians are not homogeneous. All Bangladeshis are not homogeneous. All, you know, Gujaratis are not homogeneous. The class is important. And we have a way of bringing them to us and show that uh, what happened in the colonial period, what is happening now, because this whole push to multiculturalism was uh, was done at, was was with the aim that there is a homogeneous uh, ethnic diaspora in UK. There is a, the divided into classes, they're divided into, into various groups, and it is those classes that needs to be united and become the major force, the majority of the force that will then really unite all other communities. But in terms of uh, debating in the way people like Shashi Tharoor and others debated or other people debate in various debating societies in the UK. I mean, I think a, a, a season of uh, season of derision, a season of uh, what do you call uh, wit and humor might, might be more effective. That's sometimes what I feel. Thank you, Nissa. Just to add to what Nisa has said, I would say also that people need to recognize the huge, huge propaganda machine and the control of the public narrative by the capitalist class in the UK and indeed across the Western world. Um, the only way we can combat the mistruths, the misdirections, the outright lies that are being told uh, about the history of imperialism, its exploitation and massacres is by education and pushing for the education of what imperial, what did British imperialism do across the world in the British education system would be a marked um, step forward if we could achieve it. And also in local communities, when was the last time there was a debate in your local community about the lies that you are being told every day by the British media and uh, everything that, that goes with it? I mean, at the moment, we have the most huge, um, amazing propaganda machine about the Russia-Ukraine war. I think one of the biggest propaganda exercises in history has taken place. So I think that there is no easy answer to the question from Thomas, but I think that it's really about building into our work, knowledge and information and education around all of these issues. Um, Vijay, is there anything you want to say at this point or not? Well, I want to say congratulations uh, to the Communist Party for your work. And I very much hope that someday uh, the United Kingdom would realize what it is and have a far better 
a prime minister in 10 Downing Street than it has been able to muster in all this time. Um, you almost had a pretty decent prime minister in Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, that went nowhere. Perhaps uh, at some point before I die, I'd like to see a communist in 10 Downing Street. It would make old Rajni Palm Dutt pretty happy uh, to have that outcome uh, before the world ended. Thank you, Vijay. That was very helpful. Um, at this point, I'd like to thank our two, ex two speakers, ex extremely interesting contributions, and I'd like to thank all of those who attended via Zoom and via Facebook. This has been recorded and will be available online through the Communist Party website, I believe. Just before we go, I want to draw attention to a couple of announcements, uh, but first, Nisa Ahmed referred to a pamphlet. Uh, in his contribution um, in answer to one of the questions. If you're interested in going to find out about this, this pamphlet, go to www.communist-party.org.uk and that's all lowercase, and you can order online. On Guard Against Fascism and the Life of Times of Claudia Jones are two of the pamphlets that can be obtained. And finally, just to tell you, that uh, the anti-racist, anti-fascist um, commission of the Communist Party is arranging an event on Holocaust Memorial Day in January. And we will be running a Claudia Jones event in February at Highgate uh, Cemetery. So I just now like to thank everybody for attending and thank those who have been operating in the background, um, making sure that we can do things uh, fairly well. I'm not the best um, techie in the world, so I'm grateful for their support. And the final thing is to thank all the people who ask questions. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this webinar and uh, keep an eye out for future Communist Party events that are announced either through our social media or on our website. Thanks again to our speakers and thank you to everybody for attending. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks, Ruth. Everything okay? I think yeah, it went yeah. well. It went reasonably well. I mean, obviously, I, I haven't got closed captioning facilities on my tablet. That's the problem. No, uh, I know. I think what we're going to have to do is um, think about having closed captions uh, in any event when we set up any any uh, Zoom I, meeting. I in the it was on the Facebook page, um, closed captioning, because I went onto that one as well, but it wasn't on the webinar okay um, and i switched to the facebook page because i couldn't hear we're you, so. still recording by the way <laughs> oh in that case then we better stop recording <laughs> see you later bye bye bye